Really? Okay, let's get started before Roger takes over. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. We're going to be uh, introducing 1 Corinthians today. We are, if you want to, flip over to Acts chapter 19. And this is where we left off last week with the riot in the city of Ephesus. I'm going to read a little bit of background here, and we're going to kind of talk through the map here and kind of explain some of the details behind the letter of 1 Corinthians and what's actually going on in Paul's ministry and in Corinth. And then we'll pro proceed through 1 Corinthians in the next several weeks, and then as you see on the map here, so, and the diagrams, uh, 2 Corinthians is written right along that same time period. So we're going to be in 1 and 2 Corinthians for quite a while until we get through those. But here we go. I'll, I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll start taking a look at some things. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much for the opportunity to meet together. We thank you for the freedom we have to study your word. We thank you for preserving it for us and, and giving us your spirit with inside of us. We ask that we may hear these things, that we may find direction we may find hope and we may continue to grow in, our, in our, our life as believers and be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We do also ask, Father, that we may see revival in our land, that we may have, see people's hearts turn towards you, that we may have the answers and we may have the, the information that they're designed, they may find you, that they may experience the eternal life and also the growth and maturity through Jesus Christ and his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in Acts chapter 19, we're looking right around verse 21. It's just kind of a uh, one of those verses that just kind of gives you some information, but a lot of history or time is packed into it. You see on the, uh, the chart on the map right here, Paul is in Ephesus right now. He's on his third missionary journey. There's a map of that on your, on your uh, notes. And he's coming to Ephesus in 53 A.D. Now what has taken place, before he, he left, left Corinth, he'd been in Corinth for a while and, and sailed to century, had his hair cut, went down to Jerusalem, fulfilled his vow, came back up to Syria, and then while he was doing that, he dropped off, he dropped Quill and Priscilla off at Ephesus. So they'd been ministering there in the synagogue, probably starting some churches and, you know, in homes and things in Ephesus. While they're there, and Paul's down here in Jerusalem and Syria, Apollos leaves uh, Alexander, Egypt, and comes up and, and meets him there. He believes in Jesus Christ. He knows about Jesus Christ, but his information is limited because, again, the word is still spreading out through the, the Mediterranean Roman world. And he meets Aquila and Priscilla, probably at the synagogue. They give him more information about Jesus Christ, probably say something about Corinth and the fact that Corinth has got a church started over there and many Jews have been involved. And Apollos, who's a, a speaker, a very, apparently a very dynamic speaker, wants to go over and engage the conversation in Corinth with the Jews, the Greeks. Because he, again, coming out of Alexandria, Egypt, he's trained in Greek philosophy, he's trained in, in, in speaking or oratory skills. So he goes over to Corinth, and that's where Apollos is at in Corinth at this time. Aquila and Priscilla have been here in Ephesus. Paul arrives in 53 AD and is going to be there from 53 to 56 AD, spending three years, and that's what we studied the last several weeks. He's been uh, teaching in the synagogue for quite a while. Eventually they became obstinate, and he leaves and goes to Tyrannus' lecture hall. And he's been speaking daily in the lecture hall during lunch hour uh, for, for two years. And so from Ephesus... There's been a great movement. I mean, the economy of Ephesus changed. We talked about the riot in, in, the, in the theater because of the, of the economy. The people stopped buying the silver statues for Artemis and started backing away. They, they burnt their magic scrolls. And so, I mean, the whole economy is starting to change because Paul is simply teaching daily during his lunch. He's working in the mornings, working in the late afternoons, a job like everybody else apparently, and he refers to that several times. But from Ephesus, people apparently come into Ephesus to hear and returned to Colossae and started church in Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. Many of the seven churches that Paul or John writes in Revelation start during this time from this, it says all of Asia heard about Jesus Christ. But had several things, several uh, uh, miraculous things take place as far as, as the name of Jesus Christ being honored and demons being driven out and some, some Jews were trying to use the name of Jesus along with some of their other magic incantations that they use at that time to cast out demons. And so a lot of Fear of the name of Jesus and, and Paul's message has spread to this area. That leads us into Acts chapter 19 and verse 23. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. And that's about what Paul's teaching, a great disturbance in Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is the fourth largest city after Rome and Alexandria and, and Antioch. So it's a, it's a large city. And there's a great disturbance in that city because of the way. And that's what Paul's teaching the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, uh, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. And so because they're making these, and remember, the little statues, however, they were little silver images of Artemis. People would buy them from 
the, the craftsmen, and they'd take those to the temple, and they'd offer those as their donation, as their offering, as their worship to Artemis. Well, they, they began to lose interest in Artemis, which means they stopped buying the little silver statues, which means their offerings went down in the temple, and it, it's clearly a business. They've got religion and business mixed together, and it results in a, a riot in the theater. And, and, and at that time, Paul's about ready to leave. He's going to then leave Ephesus and head up to Macedonia because besides what's going on in Ephesus, what we're going to talk about now between 53 and 56 AD, we're going to talk about what was going on in Ephesus. During this whole time in Ephesus, something's happening over here. Paul's writing 1st and 2nd Corinthians because he's got a problem over here in this church. Now, again, 1st and 2nd, I'll show you the verses here in just a moment. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, if we were to write 1, 2, 3, 4... Paul is going to write four letters from Ephesus during this time period. Actually, the fourth one is written from Macedonia. But during this time, he's going to write four letters to the Corinthians. We have got this one, and we have got this one. We call this one 1 Corinthians. We call this one 2 Corinthians. But there is also two other letters. We don't have those. I mean, we're not looking for them. I don't think they exist anymore. But Paul does refer to those. I'll show you those here in just a minute in the text. So when we talk about 1st and 2nd first and second Corinthians, we're actually talking about Paul's second and fourth letter to the Corinthian church during this time period. And again, that's not, that's, you know, people say, well, how do you know that? Well, it's, it's in the text. You can see it in, in any commentary. Uh, we'll explain it that way. But anyway, he's going to be, be taking care of these things. Now, what I want to go for verse 23, go back to verse 21, and read 21 and 22, and this kind of explains a little bit about what's taking place here. It says, after this happened, and it, that's referring to verse 20, in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power from Ephesus. And so while this is happening, growing in power here in Ephesus, it says, verse 21, after all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. So he's getting ready to leave, and he's going to head back to Jerusalem. You can see on that map on your notes, he ends up in Jerusalem, but he's not going to go from Ephesus to Jerusalem. He's been here for three years because a great door of opportunity is open. Before he goes to Jerusalem, he knows, I've got to stop in and fix any problem I've got in Corinth. So he's going to go from Ephesus to Corinth and then to Jerusalem. And how, here he goes. So after all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. So he's going to go to Jerusalem by going up through Macedonia into Achaia. This is Macedonia. This is Achaia. Corinth is in Achaia. And then on to Jerusalem. He says, after I've been there, he said, I must first, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, where while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. So what he's going to do right here, when he decides, I've got to get to Jerusalem, but I want to pass through Corinth, he then, instead of leaving right away, he sends Timothy up to Macedonia, who's going to end up in Corinth, and then Paul is going to follow later. And this is a reference right in here. He talks about his first letter right in this time period, first letter of, of, to the Corinthians and Timothy going to Corinth. It's possible that Timothy carries that first letter to the Corinthians uh, because there's a problem. And again, we do not have that first letter. When, when Timothy gets there, just a little heads up, the problem in Corinth is so severe, Timothy's going to get there, the first letter's going to get there, and, and, and the place is in chaos. There's competition, and you can see Apollos has gone there. Not that Apollos is a problem, but Apollos is going to get a following. People are going to drift towards Apollos. Others are going to drift away. They're going to start picking and choosing their favorite speakers, their favorite oratory presentations. And they've got Greek philosophy. And a lot of these speakers are not sincere. And Paul's going to address that in 2 Corinthians. They're starting to lead people away from the simple message of Christ, lead them into the more complex Greek philosophy and all these different thoughts. And the church is going to start to, to break apart. It's going to start to break into social groups. It's going to break into philosophical parts. There's going to be arguing. And one of the th themes, we'll get to this here later here in a moment, but one of the purpose of, of oh, why did I write 2 Corinthians? I think I wrote 2 Corinthians because I was thinking the second letter. 1 Corinthians. One of the purposes of the letter of 1 Corinthians is this right here. Correct behavior by correcting doctrine. Because their doctrine is becoming, their, their Christian doctrine either isn't developing or their understanding of the Word of God isn't developing or they're replacing it with Greek philosophy. Their lifestyle is reflecting their doctrine or their philosophy, their lack of doctrine or their philosophy. And they're becoming very worldly, very corrupt, and they're accepting it. They're, they're making all kinds of 
adjustments. And so Paul is going to try to correct their, their behavior by correcting their doctrine. And basically the message is you apply your new life in Christ to your daily life. The, the, your new doctrine, your new understanding of Christ should be in your daily life. Now again, he's got several chapters in 1 Corinthians in to go through, and we'll talk about those things, but that is basically the message that he sees. Well, so Timothy goes over there in 55 AD, possibly bringing that first letter, and comes back, you know, uh, there's, there's no, one, no one listened to him. And that's where we pick up 1 first, first, uh, Corinthians, is, is where is, and if you want to flip over there, you can now. I'm going to read several things to you here as we introduce this. But in 1 Corinthians, what, what it is, it, is there's been a delegation come over from Corinth. A delegation has left Corinth after Timothy's been there, and some elders, some leaders come over to Ephesus to Timothy or Paul and say, hey, here's the problem. And they basically, there's two things happen. One, they bring a report. They say, Paul, they sit down, have coffee. Paul says, tell me how it's going. And they say, oh, man, they, they tell them all kinds of stories. There, there's division, and people at Chloe's house are divided against this people's house. And he says there's, there's immorality. And so the first part of the first Corinthians is Paul is addressing all the things they shared with him while they're having coffee. All the, the I don't want to use the word gossip in a bad way, but their report. This is what's going on in the church. And so that's what the first part of first Corinthians is, is Paul addresses that delegation uh, and answers some of their questions. Or not questions, some of the problems. And then halfway through the letter, they also have a document they brought along from the church. Now, after we've complained about what's going on in the church, here's some questions the people have. How do we deal with these issues? And in the second half of 1 Corinthians, Paul is now addressing the specific questions. So the first half of 1 Corinthians is Paul's addressing, in a sense, the gossip, the report. And again, it's not gossip in a bad sense. I should think of a different word. But the report the delegation brought. The second half, he's going through itemizing the questions that they brought. And again, we don't have the letter they brought over, but it'd be nice to have. And so then he sends, sends the delegation back to Corinth in 55 AD with 1 Corinthians, which would be the second letter. What happens after that, Paul, while he's in Ephesus, the book of Acts doesn't record this, but while he's in Ephesus, he says, I've got to run over there and follow up and see what happens. Instead of sending Timothy, Paul comes over, and he's going to call that. We're going to look at it here in just a moment. He's going to call that a painful visit. In other words, he sent one letter in Timothy. They didn't listen. The delegation comes across. They say, it's, it's unraveling, Paul. It's, un we, it's out of control. Paul sends his second letter, 1 Corinthians. And then instead of sitting here thing, thinking, I hope it works out, he goes, okay, I'm going to go check. So he goes over and checks, and he refers to that quick visit straight across the Aegean Sea. It's going to be his second time in Corinth, okay? And I'll show you the verses that refer to that later. His second visit to Corinth, and he refers to it as the painful visit. In other words, he didn't come in there as friendly Paul. He came in there to clean house, and he made more enemies than he made friends. If there were people on the fence that weren't decided that what they thought of Paul, they decided they don't like him. Paul came in to clean house because there's a good majority of the church is not even the church. A good majority of the speakers aren't even Christian speakers. And Paul comes in there and really wrecks havoc. Okay? So then he returns to Ephesus after the painful visit and he writes his third letter. We don't have the third letter. He writes his third letter and he refers to that, we're going to look at it, he refers to that as his, a sorrowful letter. A letter that he regretted writing. It's one of those emails you type up and you send and then you go, oh, man, I maybe should have said that. <laughs> but not quite that bad, meaning he knew what he was doing. He had time to change his mind, but he says, I've got to write this. And so he writes this heated letter to him, calls it a sorrowful letter because he really regretted having to write it. It's like you just wish when you got together with your friends or got together with people or, you know, or your family or whatever, you can sit down and just have a fun conversation talk about how good things are going. But when things are not going well, we can't afford that the luxury of just enjoying ourselves. We've got to deal with the problem. And it was a sorrowful letter because it wasn't a, a, a positive letter. He, it made them sorrowful. But then he says, we'll read the text when he refers to this. He says, but now I'm glad I wrote it because you read it and you repented. And he says, it made you feel bad, but at least we got back on the right track. And that was the third letter. And it appears Titus carries that letter. Titus instead of Timothy, because Timothy had already come back broken. I, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Timothy comes back, they won't listen. And it says, okay, maybe I'll put you in, in a different ministry somewhere where you, you, know, you don't have this much, much pain. And then he sends Titus, and Titus is his gunslinger. 
When Paul wants a problem solved, he sends Titus. And Titus doesn't he take any captives. He doesn't make any friends. He, 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 he splits and divides. And that's what he's going to do in Crete. He's going to fix the Cretan church too. But Titus is the, is, is the gunslinger. And he comes in there and, uh, with the third letter. And Paul doesn't hear from him for a long time. This is all while the, this Ephesus riot is building up and there's revival over here throughout Asia. He doesn't hear anything from Titus. No emails, no, no messages, nothing. And so finally he becomes concerned. And that's where now we are now. The riot's taken place. In, in, in 56 AD, the riot has taken place. We've just read this. Paul decides, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, but first I've got to go to Macedonia and into Corinth. He's going to go check on the Philippian church, the Thessalonian church, and go to Corinth. And on his way up here, he hasn't heard. He's written first, or he's written the first letter, the second, and the third letter, or first Thessalonians, or first Corinthians. Titus is over there, and the last thing he wrote was this sorrowful letter and sent Titus with it. And what happened? He sent his gunslinger with a sorrowful letter and no word. Maybe they killed him. <laughs> Who knows? But Paul doesn't know what happened. So he's going to, he leaves Ephesus going up through Macedonia to come down to Corinth and go and say, he's going to pay what he's going to call it. He says, this is now my third visit to you. He's going to refer to that in the text. He says, this is now my third visit. He's on his way to visit him. And on his way up to Macedonia, guess who's on their way back from Corinth back to Ephesus? He gets to the Thessalonian church. We don't know where he's at. He's in Macedonia somewhere. Maybe he goes to the coffee shop again or whatever. And sure enough, guess who's standing in line beside him? Titus, what are you doing? Well, I'm on my way back to Ephesus. Well, I thought you were in Corinth. Well, I was. What's wrong? What's, nothing's wrong. Everything's fixed. I'm, I'm on my way. I got a letter from him, a good report. They're, they want you to come teach again. It's like, oh. And so now Paul is up here. He goes, oh, that's good news. I wasn't expecting that. So then he writes what is known as 2 Corinthians, or his fourth letter, and we've got it in 2 Corinthians. He writes the letter back to them saying, I'm so, basically what it says, oh, I'm so glad I met Titus. And he sends Titus and Luke back. Titus has just lit, left. He sends him back with Luke with the letter of 2 Corinthians. And Paul's going to follow that up in the, in the winter of 56 AD. Stay there in Corinth during the winter and leave in the spring of 57 to go to Jerusalem. You make a quick stop at Ephesus and go back to Jerusalem. And then just so you know, are you with me on that so far? Now, so now he's, in, he's now in Corinth in 56, 57, but before he leaves Corinth, just so you know, that is when he writes the letter of Romans. He writes a letter and sends it to Rome to say, hey, I want to come visit you also. He hasn't been there before, hasn't started the church, the church is up and running in Rome, but he says, I want to visit, and takes a lady from the church of Centuria named Phoebe and another delegation, gives her, she is his spokesperson, she carries the letter, she answers, she's rep he's not going to be there, but he's going to have a letter, just like he sent Timothy to Corinth with 1 first, first Corinthians, no, with the first letter, not 1 first, first Corinthians, and then Titus with another letter, he now sends Phoebe from Centria to Rome with the book of Romans, the letter of Romans, with a delegation, and then we'll talk about that later, and then he heads to Jerusalem with the intention of coming to Rome next. So, with that being said, I would like to look at this again, if you don't mind. And on your notes, on page, the first page of notes, I do want to walk through this again. What I've just told you, I'm going to tell you again. I'm sorry. But I want to look at the reference. Because people say, oh, that's interesting. Wow. And your choice now is either believe it or go home and try and research it or say, ah, where's he getting all this information? Uh, how come is he calling 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and calling... 2 Corinthians, 4 Corinthians. Well, here we go. So we're on the, on the, the, the list of notes. Uh, and just go right, right through the top of the notes there. It, I'm going to read through this. Uh, in 50 AD, Apostle Paul starts the Corinthian church. In 53 AD, Aquila and Priscilla are in Ephesus. We know that from Acts 18. Apollos goes to Corinth, Acts 18.27. We've we studied that. Paul arrives in Ephesus and begins a three-year stay, and that's according to this map that you see on the bottom of the first page. And then in 54 AD, Paul is teaching daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's from last Sunday. We talked about that. Paul sends Timothy into Macedonia, Acts 19.22. I've just read that verse to you. Now, this is interesting, just so you get a little historical background. In 54 AD, when, when, Paul, when all this is taking place, when Timothy goes to Corinth, Nero has just become the emperor. Nero's mother poisoned her husband... She married him. She had a little boy named Nero. She got in and married the emperor so that her son could become the next emperor. She then poisons the emperor, making her son the emperor, and he's 16 years old. 
Now, I, my, I don't even have a son 16 years old anymore. They're all older. But imagine one of my two boys right here, they're here today, 18 and how old are you? What? 21. 21. <laughs> well, I don't know. You guys keep growing up. <laughs> but it's like a 16-year-old, and he's ruling the Roman Empire, 16 years old. And his mother has poisoned the emperor. I mean, the guy's corrupt already. I mean, it's not even a good situation. Imagine, just pick out any 16-year-old and imagine them being in charge of a business, in charge of well, just their own life, their homework maybe. But, and now they're running the Roman Empire. And that's, that's, this is the beginning of the end because in, in, this is 54. In 67, fall of 67 or the spring of 68, Nero is going to cut off Paul's head. So we're, 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 this is the beginning of the end right here. And he's going to apparently be executed because of this riot that takes place here. Okay, so now we go on to uh, 55 AD. Paul writes the first of four letters. So I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And now we're in 1 Corinthians, and I believe this is where Paul refers to a letter that he wrote them. And that would be the first letter he sent over to Timothy. And, and you're, again, once again, you are free to judge this information. If you say, I don't know if this is right, yeah, go for it. The Bible's true, not necessarily my teaching of the Bible's true. So here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And here it says, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral, immor immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or in swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother that is sexually immoral. So notice right there, he says, I wrote you in my letter. I think he's talking about in my first letter I told you, stay away from immoral people. And he says, the assumption there was, well, we're going to stay away from everybody in the world. He says, now I'm trying to clarify that I'm not talking about staying away from immoral people in the world because you're going to have to work with the world. You're going to have to evangelize the world. You're going, you can't just lock yourself in a monastery. I'm talking to about now, he says, now I'm writing you saying, now in 1 Corinthians, in his, what would be his second letter, he said, I'm specifically I'm talking about those who come into your church and say they're believers and want to hang out with you, and they can cheat and be immoral. Those are the people I want you to stay away from. You understand the difference? He says, the world is immoral. Like, and I just make a point here. A lot of times we see ourselves in our culture, I think because we're Americans and we have a Christian background, we want our culture to be Christian. And, and again, that's a, that's a noble goal, uh, and we've drifted as a culture. But understand, there is a difference between culture and church. And the culture or the world, America in general, it's a pagan nation. It's, it's, it's not the king, America is not the kingdom of God. Now, you may disagree with me, and I, I, I respect your opinion. America is not the kingdom of God. America is a pagan nation that we live in and are evangelizing. And at times we've had a many, many Christians. We've had Christian leadership at different times. We've had Christianity in schools. We promoted it as a nation at different times. But our culture is drifting more towards paganism, which is normal because it's, we're of this world. That, that, that makes, just makes it clear for us as Christians, we are the kingdom of God or representing the kingdom of God in a pagan world. And so as our nation becomes pagan and lives like pagans, it's like, well, what do you expect? They're pagans. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a nation of, of this time period. Our job is to evangelize them. And for so long, I think churches and Christians were easy to confuse. Well, we, we live in America, so everybody's Christian and we, our job is done. It's like... Well, I think we're starting to see there are, gen or not Gentiles, there's, there's pagans, clearly, in the nation. It's like, so what are you going to do about it? It's like, well, just stay away from them. It's like, those are the people you're supposed to be evangelizing. And don't, don't complain when you see pagans acting like pagans. What Paul's talking about here is your issue is people in the church who are acting like pagans. People who call themselves believers and are living like pagans. The pagans are always going to be pagans. What we're talking about is people who are committed to Jesus Christ, they need to be living like Jesus Christ or imitating him. And, of course, evangelize. So anyway, that's a little side note right there. But anyway, that's his first letter. Then go on right here. Uh, Paul responds, oh, uh, the delegation. In fact, when we pick up here, go to 1 Corinthians, chap 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, oh, let's go ahead and... I'm looking for the reference here where it talks about Chloe. Do you guys see where it talks about Chloe's household? What's that? I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
11. Yep, there it is. Thank you. So chapter, I'm just going to read this. Now, Paul has written that first letter, and Timothy's over in Corinth, and now a delegation comes over to him, and this is where we're going to kind of pick up here today, or when we start teaching. He, chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united. In other words, he's writing the church, please, you know, we got to unite on some things. Your, your, your problem is not the pagans. The problem is you're divided as a church. And now he says right here, uh, my brothers, uh, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And again, Chloe's household, if I can say it this way, apparently the church in Corinth is seen as you know, a, a, a large church. But they probably, in fact, we know, we're pretty sure. I mean, there's no way. They don't have a large mega church building. They, 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 they didn't even exist at that time. They met, there was a large church, a large base of believers, but they would meet in different homes. And there's a group in Chloe's house that says, hey, we got some groups that are really drifting away. And so a group from Chloe's house church has come over to Ephesus and is meeting with Paul. And they have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Among these different house churches, they're quarreling. They're, they're competing. They've got this speaker versus that speaker, and, and they're competing. And, and, and Apollos is in the mix of that. Not that he's the problem, but Apollos finds himself in the midst of that. Uh, someone from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. He says, what kind of quarrels? One of you says, I follow Paul. He throws himself in the mix. There's some of the houses who say, we follow Paul's teaching. Another says, I follow Apollos' teaching. Another, I follow Cephas or Peter's teaching. Still another, oh, no, no, we don't follow any mere men. We follow Christ. It's like, and, and so then he goes on and says, is Christ divided? Is Paul crucified for you? He says, there should be no need. Apollos and Peter and Paul and Christ, we are all saying the same thing. And again, he's being very positive because as we read on, the problem is that there's others coming in and are, are breaking apart, trying to create division and bring people after them. And one of the things that we know from this time period and, and, and other studies from Thessalonica and, and other places is there's speakers that travel, not just Christian speakers, but philosophical speakers that travel and, and try to get a following. And that's one of the reasons why Apollos wanted to go to Corinth, not to cause problems, but to join in with this as a speaker and, and help build the body of Christ. Well, some speakers are not trying to build the body of Christ. What they're trying to build is a following, a following after themselves. Because if they can get a following, that following then can support them, and there's power, and there's money, and that they're using it. That's what Paul's, and that will come out very clear in 2 Corinthians. Okay. Um, that we're in, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians, where the delegation, okay. Uh, now, to that delegation, Paul writes that letter. And so 1 Corinthians is a response to that delegation. We're going to look at that here in a moment. Uh, Paul, Paul follows that with a quick visit. So now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We've got a bunch of references now in 2 Corinthians. And now remember, 2 Corinthians was written after the riot in Ephesus. Paul has left and is up in Macedonia. And now the church is back on track. They've accepted Titus uh, and his correction. And, and there's still some things that Paul is going to fix. But everything's, you know, back on track. They, they've they've re-embraced Paul, and so now in he's gonna. This is just a reference now to Paul making a trip across the Aegean Sea. There, uh, we're in Second Corinthians chapter two, verse one. So, Second Corinthians chapter two, verse one. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad? But you whom I have grieved. Now verse 3, I wrote as I did so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress. Now I think he's referring to, he's referring to that, that painful visit that he came across. And then he followed that with that, that painful letter, the sorrowful letter. So that's what he's referring to here. But now, again, you understand where he's at. He's up here on his way down for his third visit, writing a more positive letter. But he's referring to that painful visit and the, and the sorrowful letter that he wrote across there. I just wanted to show you the reference to that. Um, if you want to go again, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Again, Paul's writing from Macedonia. His fourth letter... Make, getting ready to make his third visit. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. 
He says, now I am ready to visit you for the third time. The first time was when he came down and started the church. The second time was that painful visit when he came across and basically chewed the church out, came back and wrote the sorrowful letter. And now he's gone up after the Ephesus riot, and now he's ready to make his third visit to them. And I will not, now I'm ready to visit you for the third time and will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions, but you. Now, very clearly what he's saying, I'm on my way for the third time to visit you, but I'm not coming to take a collection. I'm not coming down like a typical speaker, a professional speaker coming through to see if I can get an offering. Now, stop right here. While he is in Corinth, there is a, in, in 56, 57, spring of 57, there is a very healthy church in Rome. Now, it's amazing. We don't know how the church in Rome started. There's traditions that Peter started, but it, been, it was started long before Peter got there. It was started before Paul got there. Because if you read the letter of Romans, you'll see that Paul is, is basically writing a reference letter. He's asking for permission to come speak in the Roman church, the Apostle Paul. And so basically, that's why we like the book of Romans. Why do we like Romans? It's got theology just laid out. It's got salvation. It's got justification. It's, everything is laid out. Why? Because Paul is writing a, a thesis, a, a dissertation. He's writing his theology, saying, presenting it to the church board, saying, here's what I teach. Here's what I believe. It's right on line with Peter and, and Jesus. Uh, could I come speak at your church? Could I come visit your church? Now, he's right into the church of Rome. And, so he, and then he lists chapter, I think it's either 15 or 16 of Romans. He's got a huge list of names. Say hello to this person. Say hello to this person. It's like, what's Paul doing? He's rubbing shoulders. He's rubbing, he's being Mr. Knight. He's like, hey, mate, you guys know this guy. Say hi to him. I think he's in the church right there. Is this guy on your board? Well, we've, we've ministered together. And it's this, this nonstop of Paul. Who are you trying to butter up? I'm trying to butter up the church of Rome because they are solid. And he says right there in the letter of Romans, I want to come to you. Guess why? So I can take an offering so that you can send me on to Spain. So understand, Paul is not afraid to come in and say, okay, hey, you want to join me in ministry? I've, I've been all through Asia Minor. I've been through Achaia. I've been through Macedonia. And now I want to go to Spain, but I can't go there alone. Can you help me? But notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't ask the Corinthian church for help. Because you're so messed up. <laughs> You're, you, you're, gonna, you're so used to people abusing you, taking collections and teaching you wild things. I'm going to come and show, I'm not here to take money. I'm here to fix your problems. But while he's there, he does send a letter to Rome. So, okay, now, you guys I admire. I want to come speak at your church. Here's what I teach. Do you agree with it? I think you agree with what I'm, I just want you to know I'm on the same page you are. And I want to come and take an offering to send me to Spain. And while, while I'm there, make sure I, I want to say hi to all my friends there. And so it was... He's not, you understand, it's not that he's against taking offerings. He's, these people are broken. This is a broken church. Well, so I'm going to read this again. We're in 2 second, second Corinthians verse, chapter 12, verse 14. Now I'm ready to visit you for a third time, and I will not be a burden to you, but because, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. I want you back on the right page. I don't need your money. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I'll very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? He says, if I give you more, he says, I'm here to help you. So he's going out of his way to make sure that's clear. Chapter 13, verse 1. Chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so he's a appealing to an Old Testament reference of if there's a court case, you just can't have one witness. There's got to be two, preferably three witnesses that saw the same thing. And so what he's saying is, hey, this is my third visit to you. So he says, that's going to be good. He says, you've seen me once, you've seen me twice. This will be your third time to examine me. I wasn't just there one time or two times. I'll be there three times. So everything can be established by your own judgment of me. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. Remember the second time he was with you? That was the painful visit, so rightfully so. He says, I've already given you a warning. I already chewed you out told you what's going to happen if, if this doesn't get fixed. He said, I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, here it is, this is his warning. On my return, I will not spare those 
who sinned earlier or any of the others since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He says, okay, when I come, heads are going to roll. I warned you the first time and I'm warning you from Macedonia. If there's still some there that are sinning and, and, and flaunting their immorality and their and arrogant Greek philosophy in the front of, front of me, he says, he says, I will show you that I speak for Christ because I will take them down. He, uh, uh, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. In other words, there's some discrepancy that Christ, well, how great could he be? I mean, he died on a cross. Paul saying, I don't misunderstand that. This was a problem in their whole philosophy. Is, is Christ wasn't weak because he died. Uh, you got to understand what was taking place there. He is now resurrected in power, and that power works for me. And although Christ died as, as a servant and he died in weakness as, as Christ's servant today, I'm not going to come in and just lay down and die in your church. I want to come in and, and fix it. When, I mean, if you're in rebellion, you, you may, you're going to meet the power of God. Anyway, that's how he's writing there. But the main thing, what we're looking at right there, is that he's referring to a second visit by referring to a third visit. Uh, next thing, please. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. And I think we've already referred to it, but I'm going to read it again. I've got several references here to referring to Paul's, what we'd say, his third letter, which is the sorrowful letter that combined with the painful visit. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3. I wrote as I did so that when I came I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. Uh, go to chapter 4, verse 4, again. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but let you know the depth of my love for you. In other words, the letter that I wrote you like a father chewing his son out, I'm not chewing you out because I enjoy chewing you out and beating you up. I'm chewing you out because of my great love for you. I don't want to see you fail. I don't want to see you collapse here. It says right here, I wrote you in great distress. Who's got distress? He's distressed. In great anguish. Who's anguish? He's in anguish of heart and with many tears. Who's crying as he's writing it? Paul is distressed and crying, it's, uh, it, he says, as he's writing the letter of what we'd say 3 Corinthians. Not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love. Uh, next, go to chapter 7. We're talking about the sorrowful letter. It's that third letter. Chapter 7, verse 8. Chapter 7, verse 8. I'll read, well, I'll just read chapter 7, 8 through 12. Chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter. That's, that's not 1 Corinthians. That's what would be called 3 Corinthians. Uh, it's the third letter he wrote. We don't have a copy of it. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. In other words, you felt sorrowful, you repented, and now you're living in life. There's another form of repentance. It's just, I'm sorry I got caught, and you're going to try to cover it up, and, and it's repenting you were, were, were revealed. You're going to cover it up. You're going to go on to death and destruction. Verse 11, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation. Again, that indignation would be anger against those that have not repented. What alarm. What longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. In other words, I'm coming to, 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 to address the church. I'm coming to chew the church out. But you, and how does he know this? Because Titus has reported it. He says, but you have separated yourself from the crowd. You have indicated you're, 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 you're grieving because of the sin. So he says again, uh, what readiness to see justice done, you, you want to see things corrected. At every point, you've proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. I will not have to address you. You've cleared yourself. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of any injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. So Paul, when he meets Titus, he's very, instead of having a painful visit and being worried, I remember he just got out of a riot in Ephesus, got chased out of town basically again, and now he's coming down to Corinth thinking, they might have killed Titus, I don't know what happened. 
And now he says, oh, Titus gave me a report that some people now have repented. You're back on my side. He says, I am so encouraged. So again, you can understand his, 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 his emotional swing from being distressed because they're not listening to rejoice because they've come back in to follow the correct teaching. Um, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. You're, you should be real close to it right there. Um, I'm looking for this here. Uh, let's go to, yeah, let's go to verse, let's go to verse 13, I'm sorry. And basically what we're going to see right here is Titus is going to now, just, just an indication that Titus has met him here in Macedonia, and Titus is going to be bringing the letter, what we call 2 Corinthians, or the fourth letter. He's bringing it down, down to, to prepare, say, hey, Paul's on his way, everything's going to be fine. Here we go. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 7, verse, I'm beginning in verse 13. By all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was. That's interesting. The apostle's excited because one of his ministry team is happy. But Titus, he said, yeah, everything's going great. He's happy. Because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. Instead of Timothy, when Timothy came back, Timothy basically was crying and he'd give it up. I, I'm a failure in the ministry. Where Titus now, he's happy. He said, yeah, they're really encouraged my heart. I feel really like real successful in the ministry. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I can have completed. I can have complete confidence in you. Um, okay, we'll go on down here. <clears throat> I'll go to Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse five. I should just read this whole chapter. This is now Paul talking about having left Ephesus, gone through Troas, and coming to Macedonia, and then having met Titus there. Chapter seven, verse five. For when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest. He says, we just got out of Ephesus, three years of ministry there, the big riot, we came in, we had no rest. He said, I wasn't confident just to stop and rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on one side, or on the outside, fears within. He says, when we came into Macedonia, we're being chased by the Ephesian city council. We're coming up through, we don't, they've been beaten in Philippi before, so they're not already welcomed in Rimmon, they've been escorted out of Philippi's last time there. And so he's not welcome there. Thessalonica, the Jews had chased him out. So he's got, he's walking back. In. He's leaving a riot to go into Macedonia where he'd been chased out and imprisoned and beaten in order to get to a church that is rebelling against him. So you see, it's like, don't you love being in the ministry? It's like, oh, can't I just have a normal job? So it says right here, For when we came to Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside and fears within. That's interesting. Here the apostles say, fears within. Not this little, oh, everything's going to be fine. I just trust God. It's like, yeah, no, they're, 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 they're getting ready to imprison me. Last time I was here, they beat me. Uh, yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared. He even talked about when he went to Corinth the first time. He says, I came with fear and trembling. Why? I have no money. I have no job. I'm in a Gentile city. And no one knows me. It's like, and I'm in the ministry. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. Fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by, guess what? the coming of Titus. With all the turmoil and everything collapsing around, they meet Apollos at a Panera, you know, or a, a Starbucks coffee. Like, Titus, Paul, it's like, what are you doing here? Are you okay? It's like, yeah, I just got to have a great time in down, down in Corinth. It's like, great time? Tell me about a great time. Oh yeah, they're all back. Oh, so he says, well, our hearts were, in, were uh, downcast, comforted us and not, uh, by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He's all. Oh, he says, no, that's, a, that's all taken care of. He says, things are smooth sailing in Corinth. Paul says, well, finally, somewhere. He told us about your longing for me, which was a good news. Remember, they'd kick Paul out or they'd come against Paul. He says, now he says, yeah, they, they want to have you come back. Your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, we've read that already. Okay, so we're kind of going through this. We're down on the middle, page one. Titus gives Paul an encouraging report. We just read that. And then Titus and Luke are sent back. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 17. <clears throat> and then I think I'm done with this little spiel. Chapter, chapter 8, verse 16. 
And now Paul is writing this letter that we're looking at, 2 Corinthians. He's writing that right now saying, I'm encouraged. And he's going to give it to Titus and apparently to Luke and send them back to Corinth. So you notice the ministry plans changed. Titus was on his way to meet Paul in Ephesus, but now he meets him here. He meets him in Macedonia, comes back. He's like, I got another letter for him. So you kind of see Paul, again, he's, he's fighting several fronts. Now, again, he hasn't forgotten about the Galatian churches. He hasn't forgotten about his main concern. His main concern is who? The Jews in Jerusalem. God keeps sending him to the Gentiles, and he keeps, his main concern is the Jews in Jerusalem. The Galatian churches all through. Paul's got many, many churches that he, would have been nice for Paul to have email. Huh? I mean, would have been nice. Just think of Paul's ministry if he had the Internet. He's doing all of this without the Internet. He's doing all of this with just letters written on papyrus being sent back and forth and people carrying them. Every, just imagine, every time you sent an email, you'd have to hand it to somebody. And they say, oh, God, I'll be back in three months. And they'd come back and, well, what the, what's your response? Here's their response. Yes. Okay. And, 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 I mean, what a crazy different world it would be. And just imagine Paul. I mean, how far would Paul have gone if he had the Internet? Okay. We're in chapter, uh, chapter 8, looking at verse, verse 16. Uh, I thank God, Paul says, who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. In other words, he says, Titus is as passionate about the Corinthian church as I am. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. He says, when I wrote this letter, he says, Titus says, I'll take it back. He says, are you sure? You've just been there for a month or a year. He says, don't you want to go? No, no, I'd love to go back to Corinth. He says, I, he was willing to carry the letter for me. <clears throat> and we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. Now, we do not know who this brother is. But he is described as he's praised by all the churches. All the churches speak highly of this brother and his service to the gospel. So somehow he has done some special service to the gospel message. And many people consider, and I'll throw this out there, I'm going to call him Luke. We don't know for sure. But Luke is, again, uh, he's the one writing Acts, and we know that he's with Paul. Remember, there's times in the book of Acts where Paul's, the story is written, then they went here, then they went there, is written in the, what we call the second person, and then, or, or third person, what is it? Help me out. Is it third person? They went? Second person? Help me out. So it's not first person. Oh, great. The shop teacher reveals his ignorance. But, the, but then sometimes it's first person. We went. And that's Luke. Luke is writing. So you can tell when Luke is with Paul, He's writing, we went here, we did this, we saw this. And then when Luke stays behind somewhere and Paul goes on ahead, he writes, they went, they did. You, you understand? And so Paul or Luke is with Paul, but then right in here, you can see that Luke is, is possibly going to be leaving Paul and going down ahead of him to Corinth. And, so, and again, his service to the gospel, that could be a direct reference to his work of writing the gospel of Luke. That he's, 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 what is Luke's service to the gospel? You can see in the beginning of the book of Luke, I have carefully investigated all these things. He had personal interviews. He went through historically. He, he didn't write anything, just stories and legends and gossip. He documented everything and had footnotes for every reference in the book of Luke. It was written as a historical document. It wasn't written as fiction. Someone said this and someone said that. I just put all this information together. He says, I have carefully researched all of this. And so Luke has done a great service for the gospel, even already at this time, his gospel is already being handed around in written form uh, as far as a documentation of the life of Christ. Not legends and stories and emotional experiences, but factual history. Jesus Christ has just been entered into the historical books or the historical documents through Luke's service. So, verse 18, And we are sending along with Titus, with him, the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. In other words, possibly Luke. I suggest that. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself. We want to avoid, okay, and so they're going down. Let's go to verse 22. And in addition, we are sending with them our brother who was often pro provided for us in many years. We were, okay, and there's somebody else there. There's three guys coming back there. And now we talked about the offering. I'm going to mention this just real quick because this is going to be a big theme in 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. Is there is money involved in this. Paul wants to go to Jerusalem, and this is going to lead to his arrest. This is Jerusalem down here. Uh, he's been collecting money from the Galatian churches. He's going to collect from Macedonian churches. Not for himself. He's collecting money for the saints 
the believers down in Jerusalem who are suffering for several reasons. One, there's been a famine. Another thing, they've, they, they're in Jerusalem. They're part of the Jewish culture. They're part of Judaism. And now they have, they've admitted or they've confessed to following Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who the leaders of Judaism crucified. They got rid of him. They called him a liar. And now they're, they're being, the people that have accepted Jesus Christ as believer, as, a, as their Savior in Jerusalem, are being separated from their families. They may have lost their jobs. And not only is there a famine in the land, they're being socially driven away. They're being rejected from families, jobs. And so they're suffering. And Paul, in an attempt to come down and minister to these people, is collecting money from the Gentile churches and is going to carry it down. And we're going to see that in the book of Acts when we get back to it. He's going to present this to James and the leaders of the church to distribute among the believers to help, help the, the Jerusalem saints out. And show them that the it's a huge play, show that the Gentiles are willing to give money to help the Jews who are also, he's uniting the Gentile world and the Jewish world through Jesus Christ with this, say, hey, they're on your side. They, they believe in what you're doing. And so it's going to be, and Paul's, this is when he goes down, and this is where Paul's going to be arrested on the Temple Mount, put back on a ship, and he's going to go to Rome, but not how he intended to go to Rome. And so that's kind of the introduction right there. Uh, where I wanted to go next, I want you to go to, there's several things in it that you can look at, just different details and information. Uh, <clears throat> go to page four, and this is probably what we'll pick up next week. I kind of referred to this a little bit already. But I want to do an outline, just kind of tell you where things are at in the book of 1 Corinthians, and basically chapters one through six is Paul correcting the issues. When the people from Chloe's household come over with their complaints, this is what's going on in Corinth, Verses chapter 1 through 6 is Paul addressing the issues. The, you can see right there, the first thing is divisions in the church over who's the speakers. The second is immorality that's being accepted. That's just normal. No, that's normal for the pagans. It's not normal for the church. Three, legal battles. And again, he talks about legal battles right there. He says, solve them yourself. Instead, you're, going to the, you're taking your legal problems and going off into the pagan world and asking, them, he says, can't you? You're so wise. Again, it's a great argument because they think they're so wise. He says, you don't even have enough ability to solve your own problems. Deal with it within the church. Find some brothers in the church that can solve your problems. And, and, and he's talking about legal battles. Uh, number four, the immorality and the body's resurrection. And that's, those are the things that Chloe's household complains about when they get to Ephesus and visit Paul. They come over, these are the things they sit around drinking coffee or whatever. And he says, okay, I'll address those. And then they pull out, when they get done talking about those, they pull out a letter. And here's some questions. Question one, question two, question three. And here they are, basically. And, and, and Paul, will, Paul will begin these chapters, basically, you see, by saying, now about, then he names an issue. Most of these chapters begin with something like, and now about. I mean, you mean, you've asked this question, now about question four, now about question five. And one is immorality in marriage. Somehow, again, I don't want to ramble on here, but within the church, because they're drifting towards greed, now watch this, this is going to be very exposing for many, of, just for all of us to see. Because they're drifting towards Greek philosophy and away from the truth in Jesus Christ, they're drifting towards philosophy, worldly religion, pagan ways, they're going to start bringing in things like asceticism, things that make you holy, things that make you right with God. It's like, it's all in Jesus Christ. This is the letter of Colossians again. It's, it's all in Jesus Christ. They've got immorality in marriage. Already popping up is the concept that, well, sex and marriage, these things are, are not really spiritual. And so there apparently are people that are drifting away, even married people who are drifting away from, no, 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 I'm, I'm a Christian. I want to stay close to God. I don't want to engage in sexual behavior. Well, if you're married, Paul's going to say, that's part of the plan. It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too spiritual. And pneumatos is going to be where they're too spiritual. And, they're, and so Paul's going to address immorality in marriage, leading into celibacy in marriage. Then about food sacrifice to idols. Another is going to be divisions in worship service. There are going to be several things there as far as coming when they come to the worship service because these people are uh, immature, because they're living like pagans, uh, they have Greek philosophy, they're going to have problems with uh, the rightful place, how to behave in worship services. Uh, they're going to have social status determining who sits where at the Lord's Supper. In other words, who sits where during a church service depends on where you rank in society. And Paul's going to address that. And that goes on many other things. And then spiritual gifts. They're going to be using spiritual gifts for, for showboating. It's like, what is your spiritual gift? Look how great I am. And they're taking turns showing off with their spiritual gifts. 
And so Paul said, no, no, that's not at all what the worship service is for. And then number five, a huge one, in chapter 15, the resurrection. Because the Greek philosophy doesn't have room for a physical resurrection, they're rewriting Christian teaching and saying, Jesus Christ didn't really come out of the grave. It's more of a spiritual resurrection and that new life is in us. And though because they get rid of the physical resurrection and, and they're no longer waiting for their physical resurrection, they consider themselves as resurrected as they're going to get. They are now living in the end times. They're now living in the kingdom. And now you're in the kingdom today. Do you understand what I just said? If Jesus Christ physically came out of the grave, we believe in physical resurrection. Have we been physically resurrected? No. We're waiting for it. And so there's a kingdom age to come where we will physically be resurrected. Okay. If Jesus Christ didn't come out of the grave, but yet he was resurrected spiritually, then could you have been resurrected spiritually already? Yes. We call it the new birth. You're already spiritually resurrected. And so if you're already spiritually resurrected, you're already living in the kingdom age. This is it now. It's like, and you, you can see that happening even in doctrines today. I am waiting for my physical resurrection for the eternal kingdom. But if you can be spiritually resurrected, you're already there. You don't need to go. And that was drifting into them, so he's got to correct that. And the money, the collection of that money I was talking about, and we'll quit with that. All right. Have, have you been collecting money before this? I, I was wondering, that it's a critical, he needed to get to Corinth, why he didn't take a boat, so it was just to collect money going up. Uh, yeah, he, he, he may have been collecting money all the way through these, going to collect, because he'd been talking about collecting money from these churches. The Macedonians are going to, he's going to talk about the Macedonian gift. In 2 Corinthians, he's going to talk about the large gift these Macedonian churches have made to the Jerusalem collection. And he's going to use that as an example. It's really interesting because he's going to tell, he's going to tell them, he tells the Macedonians, again, I don't want to say this in, in a bad way, but he tells the Macedonians, all oh, the Corinthians, they're going to have a huge gift, they're really all going to be coming together. And then he tells the Corinthians, hey, the Macedonians, they've given a huge gift. They're really coming together. We don't want you to be outshined by these guys. He's almost like playing the group. Not, I don't mean it, but he's, he's saying, hey, we've got, I guess what he's doing is he's building, he says, we've got support from other people. We, we told him that you're going to be in this too. Don't, don't embarrass us and don't embarrass yourself. So let's see a big offer. But he's not, again, it's interesting. It's not for himself. It's for what he's going to take down to Jerusalem. So did he been collecting money before he made this trip? Or, or was all the money coming from that trip. I, I don't know. I know he's been planning and talking about this because even in the Galatians, because he's not going to go back to Galatia, he's going to go straight to Jerusalem from here. And he, he does talk about the Galatians have given money. So I would, I would make the presentation or the assumption that when he came through on that third missionary trip, he came to Ephesus, when he came by here, he collected some money here and he's been hanging on to that. He's going to add this Macedonian money to the Corinthian money and then and it seems to be a large amount because he's got several men traveling with him. Men from, from every church. Every, it appears that every church that gave money sent someone along with the money. So they could, they could visually watch, watch where the money went. One, protect the money, and then also make sure it's held accountable for where that money's going to be spent. So yeah, I think he's been collecting money all the way along. If not, he's been talking about it. For, he's been talking about this collection for Jerusalem Saints for quite a while. You can see it in different letters. Good for him. Hey, Next week, unfortunately, we're going back to Valley. We'll be back at as Valley. Much, as comfortable as these chairs are in the <laughs> We could come here permanently. We could. All I got to do is ask them, and they could book us here if you want to stay here. Okay. We'll be back at the other place next week, and if you have any, any input that you want to share about location, right here, please speak with the associate pastor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, because yeah, if we could we could stay here either way. It's, it's fine. I like these boards. But I like that other place too, also. I mean, there's, it's room for growth and everything. <laughs> All right, hey, thank you very much. Thank you for spending time. Thank you for being here. Father, we come to you today again, and we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that have gone before us. We do ask that we examine our own lives, that we keep them in line with your truth, with your word, and that we may continue to grow. And Father, I do ask that you reward the people for the time they've invested in your word today. And again, we thank you for this opportunity to meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you very much for being here.